And a very good morning and a warm welcome to you all to this Calvary Chapel Wellington remote Bible study. Could we please turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. This is part of our continuing study in the book of 1 Peter, and we're very pleased that you could join us today. Before we start, uh, let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your servant Peter. We thank you for the letter he has left us as part of your infallible word of scripture that you've provided for us. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word today. We thank you for every soul that's uh, gathered in the hearing of this message. And uh, we ask that each heart will be enriched and strengthened uh, by the instruction that you've left for us today and that we may grow in your son, Jesus Christ, as we study your word. We ask these things in his name. Amen. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Peter, at the time he wrote this letter, was among the most spiritually qualified people alive on earth. Perhaps, in fact, the most spiritually qualified person alive on earth at the time of writing. Not only had he been a disciple and there with Christ, but he had been a leader among the disciples and a member of the inner circle of Christ. When he qualifies himself here as a witness of the sufferings and a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, he has plenty on which to base that statement. He was there for the transfiguration. He was there for the Sermon on the Mount and all of Christ's teachings. He was there for all of Christ's, nearly all of Christ's miracles and received personal instruction from Christ. He was present the night before Christ died there in the Garden of Gethsemane and also present while Jesus was in prison that night, being interrogated and beaten. He was also among those who saw the resurrected Christ on more than one occasion and was present at the ascension into heaven. He also, uh, when he says that he'll be a partaker of the glory to be revealed, He's referring back to the previous chapter, which we studied last week, and Pastor Jared um, was saying that the glory to be revealed um, will be your rejoicing, having suffered for Christ. And Peter himself not only witnessed Christ's sufferings, but has also, by this point, suffered for Christ. Had been uh, imprisoned more than once, and he'd been beaten, and you remember in Acts, when he was imprisoned and beaten and shamed, they rejoiced to be considered worthy of suffering for Christ. And so Peter, not only as a witness to Christ's sufferings and Christ's glory, he's also already suffered for Christ. And if you recall from John 21, Christ has already told him of his impending martyrdom. And so Peter witnessed Christ's glory, Christ's sufferings. Peter has already suffered for Christ and is soon to suffer again at his ex own execution. So here in this passage, Peter qualifies himself and records that he in fact was one of the most spiritually qualified individuals in existence at the time, um, having been personally instructed by Christ, guided by Christ, being part of Christ's inner circle, witnessing his miracles, his teachings, and his sufferings, and also, to this point, having suffered himself for Christ. And in qualifying himself in this manner, he simultaneously eschews any authority that might accrue to him because of these qualifications. He refers to himself as a fellow elder, not as the chief among elders or a principal, um, not any higher 
or in any greater authority. He doesn't direct as a principal, he exhorts as a fellow. And Peter's model here is, of course, the exact scriptural model for leadership. It is always a group of elders that have authority. No individual can ever be unaccountable. And in every form of leadership, you'll see that when a leader or a person in authority has no accountability to others, that results in tyranny, or at the very least corruption, pride, and failure. Every dictatorship in the world um, started off with the revolutionary ideal, and, and then one leader was granted autonomy. And of course, it always leads to corruption and tyranny. And even in the church, the road is littered with the charred remains of good intentions, where spiritual men had some success and then were granted some form of autonomy and in lacking accountability uh, they grew prideful and of course once pride arrives uh, it's pride that tells us that the rules don't apply to us anymore that we're better than uh, what others have to adhere to and our sins are somehow benign and to be ignored and time after time tragically um, spiritual men have fallen, um, whether it be into corruption and adultery or um, financial irregularities. Autonomy and a lack of accountability will always result in disaster. And so Peter here uh, models that and says that he, despite being the most qualified spiritual individual alive at the time, is a fellow elder who exhorts rather than a chief who directs. And he exhorts his fellow elders in verse 2 to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. By virtue of his time with Christ, Peter was eminently qualified to give the direction in this letter to be a shepherd. If we turn to John chapter 21, we'll see that Peter received this instruction directly from Jesus himself. After the resurrection, after Christ had appeared to the disciples, in verse 2 of John 21, Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they said, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast it. And it's important to pause here and note the humility that Peter demonstrates here in this situation. Peter, the professional fisherman, Peter, the impetuous actor, Peter, the spontaneous and thoughtless actor is prepared to follow the guidance of a stranger on the shore having fished all night as a professional fisherman and been fishing all his life the correct answer to some stranger on the shore who says well have you tried the nets on the other side hmm, is get lost because that direction makes no earthly sense it's the same body of water they're fishing in the boat is a small boat with a shallow draft it's not an island or a sandbar or a reef and fish don't obey the rules of the road at sea and um, there's no reason for fish to be on one side of the boat and not another and so the earthly response to that is buddy if you want to hang your nets on the other side of the boat i suggest you go get your own boat and try it but 
Peter the professional fisherman is humble enough and submissive enough in this exchange to obey a stranger. And then they cast it, and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. And therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment and plunged into the sea. And the other disciples came in the little boat, dragging the net with fish. And it's at this point that Peter receives his instruction from the Lord that he is to shepherd the flock. In verse 15 of that chapter. So when they had eaten breakfast, Simon, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus' response is, feed my lambs. He asks him again, do you love me? Peter responds, you know I do. Jesus' response there is, tend my sheep. And a third time, Jesus' response is, feed my sheep. One query from the Lord for each time Peter denied Christ. And Peter may know this. As we see it, the third time Christ asked him, do you love me? He became upset. And this, in many of your Bibles, might be listed as the reinstatement of Peter, or Jesus reinstates Peter. And, and at that moment, when Christ says to Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, he's reinstating him, as the subtitles in your Bible correctly observe, as a shepherd over the flock. And so when Peter says to the elders, of whom he is one, to shepherd the flock, he is conveying that directly from Christ. And Jesus himself and Peter now use the term shepherd very specifically. And it's not the type of shepherd that we would be accustomed with but riding a quad bike and running some dogs um, and whistling behind the flock of sheep, driving them forward. A shepherd at that time led the flock from the front. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. And the shepherd was the protector who cared for the sheep, who cared for their needs and led them to safety or to pasture. Um, he walked at the front of the flock as the example to the sheep of where to go, which is the expression that Peter is using here is to shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not being lords over those entrusting to you, but being examples to the flock. And so the picture of the shepherd leading the flock of sheep is what's been conveyed to Peter throughout the course of the time they were together at the breakfast on the shore and is what Peter is passing on to the elders to whom he is speaking. And in this example, he cites serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, eagerly. If you're unhappy in service, in any kind of service, if you're only doing it because you're obliged to, then it's time to stop. Christ can build his kingdom without your dutiful service. Do it willingly, not out of obligation, but because you love to serve. It's worth noting that compulsion and willingness can exist in the same phrase. My favorite thing to do is cook and eat with my children, cook for them, cook the foods that they love to eat, and I love to serve them at the table and watch them enjoy good food. It's my favorite thing to do. That joy can exist alongside the fact that I am obliged to do it. If I fail to feed my children, some people from the government will come and take me off to prison. But 
I can enjoy feeding them and take great pleasure in it despite that obligation and the penalties that await for failing to fulfill it. And it's the same in the flock. Um, you may well be obliged by commitments you have made to serve in a particular way. You may have said you would and then feel that you are obliged to honour your word. And I quite agree with that. That doesn't mean the fact that you are obligated can rob you of the joy of serving. In addition, Peter says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. We're very fortunate in our little fellowship is that we have next to no money. And having no money um, is a complete luxury in uh, the spiritual setting, because if you have money, you often attract people who love money. And so our elders, we're fortunate, do not receive any form of financial incentive and serve honestly and willingly and voluntarily. But that doesn't mean to depart from what Peter is saying here, because dishonest gain does include the filthy lucre of money, but translates to more than just cash itself. It does mean money. And so anytime anyone is serving for dishonest gain, anyone who profits is able to fund a lavish lifestyle, perhaps, is running afoul of what Peter is saying here, is that serving for money is a tragedy. You want to be serving eagerly, not for dishonest gain. And this dishonest gain, or filthy lucre, translates as eagerness for base gain. And base gain is beyond just money. And if we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul highlights what will be in these end times. And beginning in verse 1 of that chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, Paul says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people turn away. And in that, I would suggest those three loves are what is referred to by base gain or base desires. Love of self, love of money, love of pleasure. These are the base gain or the base desires that I believe Peter is talking about because you can serve as a volunteer for purely selfish reasons. You can serve as a volunteer for prideful, wicked reasons. Are we serving in a fellowship for our own ends or as humble servants? Is the person delivering the message um, serving humbly or seeking an audience, a platform? Do we lead the youth group because we want to serve or because we like being listened to? You may have been, as I have, to some of the old large cathedrals or the old large churches that still have pipe organs and uh, seating for a full choir and seen the members of the choir perform in the worship service. But then many of them, some of them, when the sermon is being delivered, they'll pull out a novel and read for the duration of the sermon and then um, not take communion and continue to read their novel until it's time to sing again. Because they're members of the choir, not to be servants, but because they love singing and being in a choir. They're not interested in Jesus Christ or in service, they're interested in singing. And the church we attended in London many years ago was a great example of this because the choir was a hotbed of contention. There was continual jostling for position um, and influence as to who would get the best parts and sing the lead or the solo. 
and it was a disaster for the poor minister who was um, pastoring that church um, and he was constantly sorting out quarrels within the choir instead of being able to be devoted to actually serving the church he was um, refereeing disputes between members of the choir and again th these singers they weren't servants they weren't humble they were participating for their own pleasure or for their own pride and in contrast to prideful or selfish service Peter speaks in verse 4 of receiving the crown of glory that does not fade away unlike all other rewards be you pursuing pleasure or money or pride only God's rewards endure any service that we do for our own ends rewards us with things that are fleeting at best even Freddie Mercury once observed that having received all the ovations and all the applause that anyone could ever receive he said well when you're up like that the only thing to do is come down even Freddie Mercury who received ovations unlike any of us could ever imagine observed that it was just fleeting um, as soon as you came off stage it was over and so it is with anything that we gain for ourselves for our own ends King Solomon said of riches take a glance at them and they are gone and anything we achieve pridefully selfishly for pleasure or for gain is actually no gain at all only the rewards of God amount to a crown of glory that does not fade away Peter goes on in verse 5 addressing the younger people likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility the submissiveness that Peter is talking about I would suggest goes beyond mere obedience obedience is a part of it but it's possible to obey without being submissive it's possible to submit without being submissive is that just doing as you're asked but grudgingly suspiciously um, uncaringly that isn't the submission that Peter's talking about um, he's talking about genuine submission to elders and in a spiritual setting of course the Lord weighs the heart the deeds um, can be done by anyone for any reason um, God is interested in the heart and so spiritually it's the attitude of submissiveness that's important alongside the actual obedience he's talking very practically as well because every leader every commander from Marcus Aurelius to Tony Soprano will say some version of the same thing is that a wrong decision is better than no decision a bad plan is better than no plan at all and in fact a bad plan can be successful if everyone is on board if everyone puts everything into a bad plan you can succeed and again every leader who is made decisions will tell you that and they will tell you that there's actually no such thing as a genuinely good plan the academic year has started in these last few weeks and uh, my wife and I of course have made allowances we've made preparations to ensure that although we're both working that there's always someone at home to be there when the children get home and we joined with another family in our neighborhood who are friends of ours and made sure that there's always one of us home each day so the kids always go home to a parent who's there near the school it was a good plan excellent plan all sorted out and guess how many days it lasted not one 
after we'd made the plan the week before school, of course, uh, all of the uh, pandemic settings changed and uh, all of the work from home days shifted. And so our excellent plan is who would be on home on what day was immediately vacated. And all these leaders, again, whether Omar Bradley or uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, will tell you that no plan survives first contact with the enemy because no one can see the future and you never know what tomorrow brings. So there's no such thing as a perfect plan and there's no such thing as a perfect decision. But the surest way to fail is when everyone is second guessing the decision and carrying on with their own plan. So elders aren't going to be right. They're human beings. They'll probably never be right. But what will succeed is submissiveness to those elders, respect for the decision and service, eager service of the plan, whatever it might be. Oh, no, this isn't a good idea. Do it anyway. Be submissive, be a part of that plan and let God turn a bad plan into good things. Yes, all of you, this is not just the young people to elders now, but yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And here, be submissive to one another, put others first. And this is a common refrain from the moment Christ opened his mouth is that put others first. Anyone can serve themselves. Anyone can elevate themselves and expect to be listened to, but be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. This point of clothed with humility is a very specific phrase that doesn't refer just to ordinary clothing. And the phrase is referring to the apron that was worn only by slaves. And this um, apron was a badge of servitude and uh, identified one as a slave. And so by putting on this apron that Paul, Peter is referring to um, with this phrase, it's stating that you're the servant of all, that you have no agency of your own, that you are only a servant of others. And Peter justifies this servitude on our part by citing that we need to be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The word proud is mentioned 47 times in the King James Bible. The word pride is mentioned 46. Of those, I was only able to identify three times where it is used in a neutral sense. Of those times where the 47 times that proud is mentioned, the 46 times that pride is mentioned, only three are in the neutral sense, like in Job, where um, God says, have you said to the oceans, this is thy boundary. Here is where your proud waves halt. Every other time that proud or pride is mentioned in the Bible, it's always associated with something God hates. It's always set out for destruction or to be cut off or to be despised or to be opposed. The proud is always the enemy of God or God's servant. If there is one thing that God hates, it is pride. And indeed, a quick scan through Proverbs will say that there are many things that uh, there'll be many references to the fact that God hates pride. And that's not even counting um, the references to um, other prideful aspects like being haughty or selfish, lovers of self, self-serving or self-seeking or self-promoting or boastful. Um, even just the words pride and proud, God hates and God resists. Uh, other translations will have opposes. Do you want to be in a situation where God is willing to resist or oppose you? Then humble yourself. Peter goes on in verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Having made the point that God opposes and despises the proud, Peter therefore exhorts us to humble ourselves, making the point that in reality, 
there's no other option. One can't exalt oneself under the mighty hand of God. Only he can lift us up. As we've just seen, everything we pursue for ourselves or attempt to achieve for ourselves, it's all just temporary, fleeting and largely worthless. But under the mighty hand of God, he may exalt us in due time. And that's the only exaltation that actually is of any merit. We can't exalt ourselves. So since we can achieve nothing for our own gain without God, we should humble ourselves. We'll be humbled eventually otherwise. It may as well be today. And one scriptural way in which we can humble ourselves is by fasting. In Ezra 8, starting in verse 23, while on the journey back to Israel, Ezra proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way. David said, in the 35th Psalm, at verse 13, that I humbled myself with fasting. Last week, Pastor Jared was talking about suffering for being a Christian, and that suffering is inevitable for Christians. And knowing, as Peter did, that we are going to suffer, I certainly hope not in the way that Peter did suffer, um, but nonetheless, knowing that we are going to suffer, preparing ourselves for this requires us to be humbled and requires us to be accustomed to affliction. One way we can do this, humble ourselves and prepare ourselves for the suffering, is to be accustomed to discipline and to controlling our fleshly appetites on a day-to-day -day basis. And one way to do this is fasting, is that in a small way, on a regular basis, we can control our fleshly appetites. And it's one thing over time that we can learn to live without. We can live without food. And we know that that small suffering is something we can endure because we practice it with regularity. So that when the time comes and whatever form it takes, the suffering that comes upon us, in a small way, we have prepared ourselves for it. And this is something that Jesus spoke of in a manner that indicated his expectation of us after he was gone. He said that they will fast of his disciples. They will fast. He was asked by John the Baptist's disciples, who said to him in Matthew 9, how is it that we, the disciples of John the Baptist, and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? And Jesus replied to them at verse 14, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus expected it of us. It wasn't something that, like other Old Testament practices and feasts and uh, eating regulations, that was to cease. And we see that again in Matthew 6. He was talking and said, when you pray, not be like the hypocrites and um, speak long prayers. And in the same manner, he said, when you fast. When you pray, when you fast. No one would ever mount an argument that prayer isn't necessary in the Christian life. No one would even attempt that. But Jesus spoke of it in the exact way that he speaks of fasting. When you pray, when you fast. These two things are assumed. They're hand in hand. One as expected as the other. And Jesus didn't just speak of praying and fasting in the same sense 
um, in the same expectation when you pray, when you fast. He also was speaking of them in the same manner, is that it's not to be done before men. You know, when you pray, he was saying, don't be like the Pharisees and, and stand up to be seen by everybody and admired for your righteousness. No, go into your prayer closet. It's between you and God when you pray. And he said the same thing of fasting, that when you fast, you know, um, do not be like the Pharisees and um, look strained and demonstrate to everyone your righteousness through your fasting. No, anoint your face with oil so that no one even knows that you're fasting. Because at that time, he was talking about pride. Again, with the pride is that you can teach a proud man to be humble, but he'll be proud of it. And he was speaking against the righteousness or the self-righteousness of the Pharisees who uh, demonstrated to everyone how righteous they were by giving their gifts openly in the temple, by giving long prayers to demonstrate their righteousness and looking unwell when they were fasting. And of course, hating pride, Jesus' response was, don't do that. And assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And this is the same as what Peter was speaking of, is that service in the kingdom will earn you a crown of glory that will never fade away. But these Pharisees, just like Freddie Mercury, well, they've had their reward. Once they've enjoyed their moment being seen, that's it. That moment is over gone forever and worthless. So at this point, I'm not going to dwell on all the examples of fasting in the Bible, nor am I going to highlight the physiological benefits of fasting, which are many and manifest, and nor am I going to highlight the lifestyle benefits of fasting. And that's a conversation for another time. And if you are interested then by all means let's talk but noting the way God talks about pride the way he expects us to humble ourselves with fasting and the way he treats the well fed or the way he speaks of the well fed in Philippians 3 verse 18 for many walk of whom I have told you often that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Do you want to be numbered with those who are enemies of the cross and whose end is destruction because your God is your belly? When condemning the unfaithfulness of Israel through the prophet Ezekiel, in chapter 16 of that book at verse 49 God condemning Israel said that Israel was like Sodom of whom he said she and her daughter had pride fullness of food and abundance of idleness neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy fullness of food is a condemnation of Sodom and he condemned Israel in the same manner saying that once you got into the lands and became well fed, you forgot that I brought you out of Egypt. Being full of food is the opposite of what God would have for us. He doesn't want pride and fullness of food. He wants humility and fasting. And being associated and numbered with those who are proud and full of food, as we saw, of course, means that God opposes us. That's not the description we're seeking. Pride and full of, proud and full of food or humble and fasting. Peter was making a similar point just a few pages back in 1 Peter chapter 2, just a few pages back from the section we're studying now, uh, where he said, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. One of those fleshly lusts that's common to all that we can control on a regular basis is our appetite for food, our hunger for food. And Peter was saying this because, of course, in a Christian life, our pride 
will tell us that we deserve it. That you can take a break, that you can indulge. That discipline, oh, that's hard, that's for other people. You're special, says our pride. And these are the lusts which war against the soul. It's the same soul that David humbled with fasting. Fasting is the first step in which you control all of those appetites. And you can say that you're the master of them. And this mastery is important. Just a few pages forward from where we are now. In Peter's second letter, at chapter 2, he makes the point that people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. In this instance, he's talking about those who promise freedom but are themselves slaves of depravity. People are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And so these fleshly lusts that war against your soul, you can be a slave to them if you don't govern them. So fasting is one means by which you can take control of a fleshly lust, your appetite for food. You can become its master. And you can say, I have the discipline to choose Christ over food. And so we're left with a decision, each of us, in our own lives, in our own walk with Christ. Where are we today? And where do we want to be tomorrow? Do we want to be living a life of discipline or of comfort? Do we want to be living in obedience or indulgence? Do we want to be the master of our flesh or a slave to it? Because if we're willing to discipline ourselves and become the masters of our fleshly desires, that's where God's rewards lie. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Apostle Paul observed that godliness with contentment is great gain. What may feel like a sacrifice at the time is actually a gain, is actually the way God blesses us. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. And in verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. The very best way to be content with your food is to go without it for a short period. Especially if you're willing um, to take the step of designating the food that you're going to eat when you end your fast. Especially designate it as something simple. Decide that the first thing I'm going to eat will be a tomato or a boiled potato or a leaf of cabbage. If you designate that, something you've probably never thought about twice um, and never really noticed as being especially interesting. A couple of days without food and on the second night you'll literally be dreaming of your boiled potato. And then when you do end your fast, that boiled potato might be one of the most delicious things you've ever eaten. And instead of just something mediocre and boring, a boiled potato or a leaf of cabbage is actually a source of joy. It's a source of delight. And that's pretty much how God works, isn't it? Is that he asks us for discipline and then rewards us with joy. He asks us um, for obedience and out of it comes great gain. And he exalts us in his way. And that we find joy and we find the greatest joy is in obeying the creator because he knows what's best for us. And so are you prepared to trust God, depending on him, that what he asks of you is actually the best thing for you? That his exaltation is the reward that is best for us, not the things we seek for our flesh or for ourselves, but God's blessings. And if you're willing, please, I do urge you to trust him and then, then let him bless you in his way. And so 
we're glad you could join us. Uh, we're looking forward to the time in which we can all be together again. Please do reach out um, if you need prayer or any support. We'd love to walk with you uh, during the coming week. Um, and we'll see you in some way next Sunday. Let's close with prayer. Father God, thank you for this message from your servant, Peter. Thank you for this, your son, Jesus Christ, who through his sacrifice allows us to come into your presence to praise your name and to learn and grow with you and we thank you that you're a good god who knows what is best for us and has left us your instruction in scripture so that we may know how to serve you and worship you we ask that this word that the scripture dwell in our hearts this week and strengthen us in our walk with you that we may be your servants we ask these things in the name of your son jesus christ amen god bless you and keep you have a wonderful week and we'll look forward to being with you again in whatever way we're able